Good evening, and a very warm welcome to what I know is going to be a very, very special evening for everybody involved in the European movement. My name's Helen Campbell. I'm Secretary of St Albans for Europe, which is part of the huge grassroots movement that is, has been campaigning for a people's vote and to remain in the European Union. This evening, we will be welcoming the new president of the European movement, Conservative, for now, for now, <laughs> and former Deputy Prime Minister, Lord Michael Heseltine, uh, Lord Heseltine. We will also be hearing from the chair of the European movement, the Right Honourable Stephen Dorrell, and from vice chair of the European movement, Lord Adonis. Two of the panel were whiskers away from becoming MEPs last week, so we are very lucky that they are here and not in Brussels. The European movement's growth since 2016 has been truly astonishing. Three years ago, there were 12 branches. Now there are 150 and thousands and thousands of activists. We are all a part, a vital part, of the backbone of the People's Vote campaign with activity all over the country, week in, week out, and all year round. If you haven't already, please do visit Lauren on the stand over there to pick up some freebies, and please be sure to put your hands in your pockets and make a donation to help continue the wonderful work of this fantastic movement. So they are freebies, but you know how it works. <laughs> Before we get on to the main speakers of this evening, I've been asked to tell you a bit about myself and the group I help to lead. So as I said, I'm Secretary of St Albans for Europe. That sounds odd to me, because as the rest of our committee would tell you, I take abysmal notes and produce terrible minutes. But I took the role on because it was vacant and someone needed to. I know I'm not alone when I say that Brexit has never made me think, why me? But rather, why not me? Now I'm standing here, preparing to introduce some of the country's most influential pro-Remain politicians and campaigners, some of whom have really been in the headlines lately. More about that in a minute. The nucleus of St Albans for Europe was formed in a pub at some point in late summer 2016. It was definitely a liberal elite pub. You know, the sort that's got five different tones of avocado on the walls as well as on the menu. We're the town that's actually a city. We can count Stephen Hawking amongst our past residents. And we are the home of the original hot cross bun. We are not your average home county's market town. As one of this evening's esteemed speakers once called us, St Albans is resolutely a citadel of Remain. I never really saw St Albans as radical. OK, so it's not exactly Brighton, but we do share a train line. So maybe the two places do have some sort of weird rebel connection. So about 40 of us, almost all strangers to one another, came together from various backgrounds to pour out our despair and some gin at what had happened. It felt like a defense and an attack, both at the same time. A defense that said, I did not vote to leave, and I will not be part of this horror and an attack that said, I am so disturbed by what has happened, I have to be part of the fight against it. Whatever that fight is, if there was a fight to be fought. Because I recall not knowing where it might lead, or if it might lead anywhere. We didn't know. It didn't deter me, it didn't deter the many new friends I made that evening at that very first meeting in St Albans. And happily, it did not deter you, all the thousands and thousands of others all over the country who, we later learned, were holding similar meetings of their own in pubs, halls and living rooms all over the newly disunited kingdom. I said, uh, I said earlier that it's not been why me, but rather why not me. And I think that's the very essence of the grassroots fight for a people's vote and to stop Brexit. Thousands of us stood up and said we would not let others take all the responsibility we would not let others take all the load. We would not stand back and let others do the fight on our behalf. In short, that we would not sit down and we would not shut up. And it's because of that why not me response by so many Remainers all over the country that the defence against Brexit did become a very effective attack on Brexit. And we have turned the tide. 
It's why the UK now has the largest pro-European organisation in Europe. It's why a million of us marched in London two months ago. And it's why we are all here now. The growth and effectiveness of the movement was evident again last week with the fantastic European election results, when more people voted for a People's Vote party than the party that shall not be named. It is also the reason why we are closer than ever, ever before, to securing that people's vote. We have built this initially through our collective dejection and desperate hope, and later through our courageous energy and willful determination. I am so proud to be part of it, and I am deeply, deeply grateful that so many others have kept going. Whether you shared a petition on Facebook or whether, like our main speakers this evening, you are a household name, arguing our case and fighting our corner in public every day. And we do have to keep going because Britain deserves better than Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Testiculi ad Brexitum, as Jacob Rees-Mogg might say. <laughs> But let's face it, probably hasn't actually said. <laughs> Apologies to any Latin speakers. All the local groups are the lifeblood of the grassroots drive for a people's vote. Look at what we've achieved so far. I think we are going to do this. I think we will get a people's vote. We will have to campaign well and we will have to campaign hard to win it. But we'll be ready. Now let me turn to the inspiring individuals who are helping us get there. It has often been said that watching Brexit happen is like watching the Titanic go down. And we know that all Hollywood disaster movies need stars. The Remain cause has plenty. There have been analogies with Spartacus about one Remain figure this week. Is that Alistair Campbell at the back? I have a Lib Dem, Lib Dem membership form here for you if you require one. And anybody else. And one of our speakers tonight did, of course, earn the nickname Tarzan back in the 1970s. So, very fortunately, Remain has some real, true heroes. People who truly put country before party. Lord Heseltine, I am really sorry that I missed your very powerful speech at the last march. I tried, but I was still stuck on Park Lane behind the million other people who were there. <laughs> yeah. If you could do it again tonight, I'd be really grateful. But first to speak tonight will be the chair of the European movement. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to introduce the Right Honourable Stephen Dorrell. Helen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, Helen, thank you for telling the story of what happened in St Albans, because the story from St Albans is a story that repeats itself time and time again around the European movement over the last uh, two and a half years, nearly three years uh, now. Uh, when I became chair of the European movement in the end of 2016, we had roughly 20 branches. I'm delighted to say we now have a total of nearly 200 branches and that number grows every day, reflecting in localities up and down the country the story you told uh, from St Albans. It's a story I can repeat uh, from my experience in the West Midlands over the last month, where we have active branches in Worcestershire, in Warwickshire, and some of the most, uh, the most challenging uh, branches in Staffordshire. We have a branch in Stoke-on-Trent, holding, making sure that the arguments for Remain, for the people's vote, are taken not just to the liberal elite, excluding uh, St Albans, uh, but all around the country, to secure the change in our nation's course, which is the purpose for which we are here. But the main purpose for which we are here is to welcome our new president, as Helen has said, and welcome not just Michael, I will come on to Michael, if I may, in a moment, but to welcome two members 
of Michael's family, his wife Anne, who travels everywhere with him and is one of Michael's most admiring and loyal uh, supporters. We, those of us from Tory backgrounds will have seen Anne on many occasions. But it's a special pleasure this evening to welcome Michael's sister, Yvonne Heseltine, who is a long-standing member of the European movement. And Yvonne, you're particularly welcome to come and watch Michael's installation and confirmation as the president of the European movement. It's a real personal pleasure to welcome Michael uh, to this role. I'd like, if I may, before going on to talk about Michael's role, just to pause for a second to reflect on Michael's immediate predecessor, Lord Paddy Ashdown, who, as you will remember, sadly passed away at the end of last year. He was a long-standing and com committed supporter, not just of the wider European cause, but specifically of the European movement, uh, a long-standing friend, nothing was ever too much for Paddy, and we, we, all, we have missed him since his passing at the end of last year. He left uh, m uh, big shoes to fill. But of course, Paddy was only the most recent of some distinguished former presidents of the European movement. I can think of uh, Michael's friend and mine, Ted Heath, I can think of Harold Macmillan, and I can think in particular of our founding president, Sir Winston Churchill. The presidents of the European movement are people who have made a huge difference to our country's history. They leave major uh, shoes to fill, and no one better equipped to fill those shoes uh, than Michael Heseltine. He's been one of the most consistent voices arguing the case in good times and in bad that Britain's destiny lies in a close relationship with its neighbours in Europe. Michael has always been willing to take the heat on that argument, not merely to make it when it's popular, but to make the argument when it's unpopular. And he showed that, of course, last week uh, when he chose the European argument over a lifetime of commitment to the Conservative Party. We all know. We all know that politics involves compromise. And we should never apologize for a willingness to bring people together, to create consensus, to move forward. Politics does involve compromise. But politics involves something else as well. It involves knowing when not to compromise and when to draw the line. That is what Michael demonstrated last week. He knows when to draw the line. The European movement is proud to be cross-party and to represent people of no party. The European movement was a, sp a founding sponsor of the People's Vote campaign. We didn't inquire which party people belong to. We simply asked them to sign up to a campaign for a new People's Vote to reverse what John Major, a government colleague of Michael and I uh, in former years, what John Major describes as an historic mistake. The European movement has been the ground army of the People's Vote campaign. The reason why we were able to put 150,000 people on the streets of London last summer, half a million people on the streets of London last autumn, and a million people on the streets of London in March of this year. That was the work of the European movement and those branches that Helen started off by talking about. We now have... We now have two objectives. First, to follow through that campaign and secure the people's vote. We shouldn't imagine the argument is won. We're winning, but it's not yet won. 
So the first objective is to secure that people's vote, and the second objective, having secured the people's vote, is to ensure we, this time we win. We win the argument for our country's future as a mainstream member of the European family of nations. So we're here this evening to welcome to our team a new president. We're engaged on the greatest campaign of our age. It is only right that at the figurehead of that greatest campaign of our age, we should have the greatest campaigner of our age. Please welcome Lord Michael Heseltine. It is my privilege to accept your presidency. I shall not detain you long. At my age, my principal role is to find my successor. <laughs> but not before we've won the immediate campaign. Throughout history, nationalism and racism have been used to whip up people's passions to emotional boiling point. Too easily, they tip the balance from argument to bloodshed. Who today can name England's seven kingdoms? Who can remember that they were ultimately united at the edge of the sword by Ethelstan a thousand years ago? Wales was to follow, Scotland and Ireland to form the United Kingdom. At every twist and turn, many fought and died. Yorkshiremen and Lancastrians fought the Wars of the Roses hundreds of years later. If we weren't fighting each other, well, there were plenty of foreigners to fight. The Italians, of course, they were called Romans then, but the Italians, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, and then most recently, the Germans. Across Europe, the horror of repeated slaughter unleashed a demand that it must never happen again. The European movement was born in Churchill's phrase, jaw, jaw, rather than war, war. As a teenager, I listened to the chorus. As an undergraduate, I joined my party to support it. As a parliamentary candidate, I argued for it. And we have enjoyed an unprecedented period of peace in Europe. We have created a Europe of parliamentary democracies. We have shared sovereignty because it is in our individual national interest so to do. We have enjoyed living standards historically unprecedented. The Brexit case, it is a slickly packaged manifesto targeted at those most dangerous of human emotions nationalism and racism. It is articulated with skillfully woven images of foreigners, immigrants, bureaucrats. Its critics dismissed contemptuously as out of touch elite. The speeches, well, yes, they're easy. The priorities, yes, simple. But the reality is very different. That is the case, reported and repeated, with ever louder articulation, designed to draw down, drown out the critical question. Any inquiry about the details is swept aside in a ramble of evasive generalizations. You've heard them all. Too many immigrants. A new world for industry and commerce free of Brussels red tape, a united kingdom astride the world. Let us look below the surface. Start with immigration, a word so often on Mr. Farage's lips. Ask the question, why has the British government done so little to exercise its sovereign power to control non-European immigration. Control? 
It is completely within our power. Europe, it has no locus, no interest in forcing us to take immigrants from India or the Caribbean, or indeed America or Australia. But the answer, of course, the answer is we need them. Our public services depend on immigrants. Visit any doctor's surgery, a hospital, a university, an old people's home, our wealth-making companies, and start counting. Today, most immigrants come from outside the European Union. We are grateful for the immense contribution they make to our country. <laughs> We're told of a new world for our great enterprise countries. Well, my adult life has been sustained not only by the high-octane excitement of public life, but also by the stimulus of the private enterprise world. I know something of its thrills and spills. You win some, you lose some. Hopefully, the balance is on the right side. What turns investors into gamblers is uncertainty. Brexit has overshadowed the workplaces of our country with impenetrable clouds. What serious decision can men and women rationally take when faced now with a political crisis to which there is no end in sight? For the small business people, and the self-employed, it is their savings, their livelihood that is at stake. For managers and directors, they are the trustees of their company's fortunes in which are invested the nation's savings. They want and they are entitled to answers that sweep away those clouds. And until they get them, they will sit on their hands delay decisions, adopt survival strategies. The enterprise culture of our country has Brexit round its throat. That is what Mr. Farage has achieved. Now, I admire the men and women charged with great commercial and industrial responsibilities whose warnings increasingly are carried in foreboding headlines. Plants closed, investment cancelled or delayed, jobs lost and offices moved to the continent. All of these things just point in one direction. And then they talk of deregulation, free of the Brussels bureaucracy. Well, we face, we face a future of unprecedented potential. Change in happen is happening in a way that my generation, and indeed others a great deal younger, hardly appreciate. Brexit supporters argue for a wave of deregulation. Well, I've spent my life fighting to create a climate of opportunity for the private sector. I think, I think I've actually privatized more individual items than any other single minister. As a businessman, I know something of the irritation of regulatory obfuscation. But I also know something else about how the world actually works. I know that the battle for world technological supremacy is driven by the massive defense, space, and academic research programs of the United States, China, and a range of increasingly rich nations. Europe together, in partnership, can compete in this league in a way that no nation of our size can. Of course, <laughs> of course, private enterprise plays a critical role in exploiting and spreading the benefits into every aspect of our life. But the lifeblood fueling competition, 
are the resources and purpose of states. I also know that regulations are the building blocks of civilization, and they protect all of us from that tiny number of our fellow citizens who will do anything to make a quick buck. Regulations set standards that guarantee our safety, our health, protect our environment, and a great swathe of modern life. They also create huge opportunities of the future. These regulations, these interventions into the market will enable us to meet the towering challenges of modern times, be it climate change or automation, the refugee problem, or the rise of transnational cooperation so powerful that they can defy governments and transcend borders. All these challenges can be best met by nations working together. All these nations... All these challenges have been and are being addressed by the European Union. So why do the Brexiteers never give us a list of the regulations they wish to get rid of? <laughs> and there is one simple devastating answer, because they are frightened that the revelation of such an agenda would terrify people by the threat it represents to standards that most of us treasure. And then they tell us that there is a role, an opportunity for a stronger, more vibrant United Kingdom. That is at the heart of the Brexit case. A new place in the world Opportunities to grasp and glory reform. The easy speech for the cynical opportunist. Last Sunday revealed a very different, very chilling glimpse of reality. There is now a real prospect that Brexit would break the United Kingdom. In Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, that is the only credible interpretation of the polls in that European election. <coughs> Nationalism should never be confused with patriotism. <laughs> I am a European because I want this country to stride the corridors of world power, sit at the top table, be there, where the action is. I am a European because I am a patriot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have never met a Frenchman, a German, Italian, or any of the other 24 citizens of Europe who were otherwise in their own national self-interest. And I will never vote to risk, prejudice, or undo this most civilized, constructive, peaceful initiation in the history of our continent. Of course, I have been much criticized for refusing to support Brexit. So I say this to my critics. What is it you want me to do? To betray everything that I have believed and argued for all my adult life to explain why every conservative prime minister except the present one was wrong and she was even right at the time of the referendum <laughs> am I supposed to leave the interests of the younger generation go hang or is it that you just want me to stay silent to wait for Conservative Central Office to send me a little blue book this time, not a little red one, a blue book, so I can thumb through the index under Europe and read out the party line. Well, I can think of a party that does believe just that, 
and its name begins with a C. But it is not the Conservative Party that I know and to which I have devoted my life. As a member of that party, I have just one voice. But five million Conservatives like me voted to remain. That, that is too loud a voice to ignore. And let me spell it out to my parliamentary colleagues. You seek the vote of a handful of elderly members in what is all that is left of the Conservative Party if you want to. You doff your cap to Mr. Farage if you wish. You turn the Conservative Party into a branch office of Brexit if it suits you, but understand that there is a wider audience without which you will never achieve that priceless political privilege, power. The power to achieve things, the power to make a difference, the power to build a society that you can be proud to call your legacy. You may think your careers depend on a handful of members of the Conservative Party, that is a grave mistake. Your careers depend on the young generation between 18 and 25, where today you have the support of only 5%. Your careers depend on an electorate in which you have majority support only once you get above the age of 51. And you need to sit silent, alone, in the night, and not just ask but answer the question of our time. How do you win these people back? I warn you, they will not come back by hoping to outflank Mr. Farage. Why vote, why, why, why vote for the monkey when you can have the organ grinder? They will not come back by the use of that classic weaponry of parts of the Fleet Street print media, the character of assassination of political opponents. Mr. Corbyn is in just as much trouble as the Conservatives and has just as little prospect of forming a majority government. Social media, <laughs> social media has changed the political landscape. For many people, who support Brexit, the European election results this week were a verdict on the failure of the Conservative Party's government to deliver promises made in the last referendum. But if we've learned anything over the last year, it must be now that we cannot enjoy all the rights of being a member of the European Union with none of the responsibilities that necessarily go with it. The heady, if intellectually incoherent, claim that we can have our cake and eat it has ended up choking the mother of parliaments itself. The consequence is that there has been no stable majority in parliament or the country for any specific way of leaving the European Union. But the Prime Minister is leaving Downing Street. The government is paralyzed and fearful the domestic agenda is frozen by Brexit. The rest of the world looks on aghast. And the Conservatives, what are they doing? They're beginning a summer context to pick a new leader. I fear both the process and the result will be one that I, together with many of the five million Conservatives who voted to stay in the European Union at the last referendum, do not like. Indeed, the prospect of a new Prime Minister being chosen by perhaps little more than 100,000 Conservative Party members in the current circumstances fills me with dread. We have started an arms race in which candidates vie against each other for who can be the most Faragist. 
This will be followed by the sight of a new prime minister heading to Brussels, armed with a mandate from the party to rip up the withdrawal agreement and remove the backstop, even though Theresa May had herself had expressly promised when we secured the extension of Article 50 that the British government would do no such thing. When this effort fails, our European allies have already told us it will fail. The new Prime Minister will find the maths in Parliament against agreeing any form of Brexit are quite unchanged. The new leader will then face a choice. Find new words for the same old song. Decide to follow the invidious tradition of their predecessor. Blame the EU for the failure of Britain's Brexit process and then seek to run the clock down to a default no-deal departure from the European Union. Such a decision, which would deny either Parliament or the people a say on a no-deal outcome that neither, that neither of them want, would be nothing short of a democratic and constitutional outrage. Parliament will not let it happen. If successful, the consequences for business, for young people, for the integrity of the United Kingdom itself would rightly be hung around the neck of the Conservative Party for a generation to come. Some will say the new leader could choose to call a general election or perhaps have one forced upon them after losing a vote of confidence. But with Brexit unresolved and Mr Farage on the march, would any rational Conservative MP want to fight an election today? The consequence would in any case be either a Tory-led or Corbyn-led minority-hung parliament. That would settle nothing. Or are they planning an alliance between the Conservative Party, the party of Disraeli, Churchill, Macmillan, Thatcher, captured in this alliance by the narrow nationalism and phobic politics of Nigel Farage. None of these options will solve this Brexit crisis. Neither will bring about the lasting settlement we need. Many months ago, I warned my party that millions of its traditional supporters feel as strongly as I do I do not now need to repeat the warning. Two recent tests of public opinion in the local elections and the European elections have turned that warning into facts. So I say to my party, I say this, turn yourselves into branch offices of Brexit if you wish. But if you do so, you're on your own. Those upon whom you depend to win power in a general election will not come back. Good luck and goodbye. The European election results were not just, however, a verdict on the Conservative Party. They were a damning verdict on Labour's failure on this, the great issue of our time. Just as I voted Liberal Democrat for the first time in my life, well because, <laughs> because, because I will not vote to make this country poorer and less powerful. Many members, many millions of Labour voters voted for parties that gave full unqualified backing for a people's vote. Those traditional supporters will not be going home to the Labour Party until this issue is resolved. I'm not used to giving advice to Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> but it is obvious to me, as much as it now apparently is obvious to his closest allies in the shadow cabinet, that he needs to reconnect as a matter of urgency with the overwhelming majority of his traditional voters. Indeed,
Contrary to some of the more excitable parts of the media, these European elections were not a mandate for Nigel Farage's plan to crash out of the EU with no trade or security deal at all. There was no mandate for this humiliating New Deal Brexit in the referendum of 2016. It was barely discussed, and people like Mirage, Mr. Farage were talking about e how easy it would be to get a deal. It would be a gross misreading of him now, who has just won by a small number of percentage points more than he did when he led UKIP in a low turnout to conclude that there is now a majority for the crash out Brexit he wants to inflict on the British people. The five firmly pro-European parties, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, the SNP, Change UK and Plaid Cymru won many more votes than the U UKIP and Brexit parties combined. So today, I want to appeal to every sensible Conservative Member of Parliament, to potential leadership candidates, and even to the Labour leader, not to force Brexit on us now. I ask them to stand up, to speak out for our democratic right to have our say on Brexit. Whether you want to leave the EU or stay in, the only way to unlock the Brexit process in Parliament, the only way to secure a stable majority in Parliament, the only way to legitimise the outcome so we can build a lasting settlement in this country is to give the people a final say. If we get that final say, if we get that final say, I know that we must fight to win, to stay in the European Union. And I also believe that we can and we will. The great irony is that today, in the midst of a crisis about Britain leaving the European Union, Britain's pro-Europeans have finally found their voice again. I marched with a million voices to Parliament Square just two months ago. We are now one of the most powerful voices in favour of Europe anywhere within the European Union. We now belong to a great army covering every region and nation of our great country. We can now genuinely be described as a European movement. We know that the inspiration, we know that the inspiration for the European movement lies in the horrors of three European wars in 75 years. Our purpose remains crystal clear. We stand for a stable, peaceful Europe. We stand for a Europe union of parliamentary democracies. We stand for a home market big enough to compete. When our time comes, we must stand at the bar of history to account to tomorrow's children for our stewardship of their legacy. That time has come. Here we stand. Here we fight. Join us. I know that I speak for the whole room in saying thank you for your inspiring and encouraging words of wisdom and warning. Your clarity of assessment of the events that we are going through in this country at the moment are absolutely invaluable to all of us, whether we are new to politics or have years of experience. 
So thank you indeed. The European movement is incredibly lucky to have you at its helm. Ladies and gentlemen, just before we move on to our third and final speaker of the evening, I just want to note that our speakers won't be taking questions uh, from the floor tonight. However, I am assured that they are all prepared to mingle for a while after the close of events, and there are some media arrangements as well, so uh, please do feel free to uh, stay around, and uh, if you wish to, to mingle as well, that would be great. I would li like now to hand you over, hand over to our final speaker for the evening, uh, a man who has been a great supporter of the European movement. Many of you have, I'm sure, seen him speak um, on a range of issues linked to Brexit, some of the reasons that led to Brexit, um, and how we may stop Brexit. Um, he did come to St Albans, and uh, we welcomed well over 250 to 300 people who heard from this gentleman. Please make him very welcome, Vice Chair of the European Movement, Lord Adonis. Ladies and, Ladies and gentlemen, Tarzan is back. He has become our president, and there is nothing we cannot do under the leadership of Michael Heseltine. So give him a huge round of applause for an absolutely an absolutely brilliant barnstorming speech of a kind that so many of us uh, remember when we were uh, awestruck by his uh, performance uh, as uh, Deputy Leader and Deputy Prime Minister. And can I also say it wasn't just a brilliant speech, it was also a very moving speech. Uh, and I say that as the son of an immigrant and the son of a Cypriot immigrant who came to this country because at the time when he came to this country, Cyprus was effectively at war with Britain in a war of independence. Both countries are now in the European Union. It is unthinkable to Cypriots and to Brits that we could ever be at war again. That is the story of Europe. The European Union is the best peace project in the history of Europe. Indeed, it is the only effective peace project in the history of Europe, and we should fight until the last vote is cast in this second referendum to see that we remain in the European Union. The, my, Michael uh, and uh, Stephen noted that our first president uh, was Sir Winston Churchill and our greatest president. His lieutenant in, for, in forming and forging the European movement in the late 1940s was um, Harold Macmillan, who went on to become prime minister made the first application for Britain to join uh, the European Union, which tragically failed because it was vetoed by de Gaulle, which should be a stark warning to those who think that coming out is going to make it easy to come back in again in future. And Macmillan, in due course, went to occupy the post of Chancellor of Oxford University, which he shared with my other... Michael is one of my heroes. One of my others is... Roy Jenkins, who was the only president of the European Commission, which this country has produced, who was a profound and passionate pro-European on the Labour side, who led a rebellion uh, against um, the, uh, a three-line whip on his side when his time came, and was in many ways the father of European Monetary Union too. But I remember uh, Roy um, once recalling how Macmillan's explanation of why there needed to be a chancellor for Oxford University, because the chancellor is largely ceremonial and wears very elaborate gowns, but doesn't perform many uh, 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 effect, uh, efficient roles. And he said, my dear boy, he said, if there wasn't a chancellor, there couldn't be a vice chancellor, and then there'll be nobody to run the university. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, the reason we have a president is that with a president there can be a, a chair, there can be a vice chair, but more to the point, there can be 200 
local European movements who are moving mountains, locality by locality, and you are the people who will see that we win this second referendum because we are now by far the biggest and best organised political movement in the country. Michael, that is what you are at the head of, and that is what you will inspire on the ground. And that 200 will become 400 and will become a movement of hundreds of thousands. So under your leadership, I do believe that we can go ahead and triumph. Now, um, I was privileged um, a few months ago to hear Michael's speech at the Great Rally in, in uh, Parliament Square. And there were two remarks that he made that stick in my mind and which go to the heart of the case that we make for Europe today. First, he said of Churchill himself, which goes to the heart of the argument about Brexit at the moment, that for Churchill, isolation was not Churchill's hope, it was Churchill's fear. His whole policy as Prime Minister in the Second World War and after was to create a united Europe in close alliance with the United States so that we could bring about peace, democracy, stability and prosperity across Europe. It would never have been Churchill's policy to seek to isolate Britain apart from Europe or apart from the United States. That is absolutely correct and it goes to the heart of the argument for Brex against Brexit today. But the other very moving section of Michael's speech was at the end when he was surrounded by many of the activists for uh, an organisation called Our Future, Our Choice a brilliant organisation of young people which is campaigning up and down the country uh, against Brexit. And by the way, that is how we will win the referendum. The young will mobilise the young and they are not going to put up with having their futures taken away from them because as, um, because as, one, uh, as, as, uh, as one student said to me when I was speaking at a, a university recently and explaining how under the Brexit plan our European citizenship, which gives you the right to live, love, work, travel, settle in 28 countries, is going to be reduced to one country. One of them said to me, I now get it. What you are saying is that Brexit means that we will be shut up on a small island with Jacob Rees-Mogg, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage. <laughs> and uh, that is what happens. Though, of course, it may well be that Boris is shut up in some other context himself, aren't they? As, uh, though I don't... So let me say, let me say quite openly, I do not believe in restricting anyone's freedom of movement. <laughs> and I think the appropriate penalty, if, uh, if the court so decides, is that he should have to pay 350 million a month. <laughs> we do not seek isolation, we seek unity. But when Michael made the remarks in... Uh, Parliament Square, he was surrounded by young people from our future, our choice. And the most moving moment, I thought, Michael, was when you said that in previous generations, students and young people of that age had had to fight in successive wars. Not only they had to fight in successive wars, but a large part of those generations were killed, maimed, injured, and psychologically damaged beyond repair. We do not want that to happen to our generation. We do not want it to happen to any future generations of, of Europeans. And the best way of ensuring it does not happen is for the European Union to become, as Churchill said, the bulwark of European unity and progress and not to play fast and loose with it. And that brings me finally to... Uh, to uh, the tradition which Michael is inheriting as president of the European movement, which is the tradition set by Churchill himself in his first great European speech after the Second World War, which was at Zurich in 1946, when he called for, and he did not mince his words, Churchill called for a kind of United States of Europe, and he said, crucially, we should form a kind of United States of Europe, not they should form, but we should form it. He always saw Britain as at the heart of European unity. These were Churchill's concluding words. We hope, he said, we hope to see a Europe where men and women of every country will think as much of being a European as belonging to their native land, and that without losing any of their love and loyalty of their birthplace. We hope wherever they go in this wide domain, to which we set no limits in the European continent, 
that they will feel, here I am at home. I am a citizen of this country too. Let us meet together. Let us work together. How proud we should all be if we had played any useful part in bringing that great day to come. We have played a proud part. We have, are installing as our president somebody who has done more for the cause of European progress and unity than any other with Brit alive today. We welcome you, Michael, as our president, and we will fight under your banner to keep Britain in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for your incredibly inspiring and encouraging words this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will join me once again in thanking all of our three esteemed speakers this evening for their integrity and their leadership. Thank you very much again. It just remains to, for me to remind you all that, <laughs> apologies, <laughs> there is a bar, <laughs> just to remind you that there is a bar over there, uh, please do feel free to, to visit the bar and uh, also please do not forget if you haven't been already to visit Lauren on the stand over there for those freebies that are not really freebies, uh, there is a big donation bucket, we'd like to see it full by the end of the evening, thank you very much. And again, as I said, please do feel free to stay around, stay in the room and uh, mingle, meet other you know, this room is brimming with passionate pro-Europeans. Let's mingle. Keep the fight going. And thank you very much to everybody for coming. <laughs>